Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Hacking Common AD Misconfigurations. My name is Carol, author of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Tim Medin, SANS Principal Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Tim. Great, thank you guys for, uh, for coming out. I just realized I may have picked the worst scheduling date of the year to do a, a webcast. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm guessing the uh, you know 100 or so people who are here, you may not have heard that the uh, the Holiday Hack Challenge actually came out uh, this, this morning, I believe, or was it last night? Um, but it is out, so uh, yeah, join us here briefly, and then you can go uh, play some more. So, anyways, without further ado, let's let's uh, begin here. By the way, somebody asked beforehand, can we get a, get the slides? Absolutely. Go to redsiege.com/badad. It looks like badad, I guess. Uh, but feel free to check that out. You can grab the slides there. That way, you don't have to take screenshots. Although, feel free to do so, right? So, anyways, let's uh, let's begin here. A quick intro here. My name is is Tim Medine. I am a SANS instructor. I am the lead author of SANS Security 560, the uh, the network penetration testing course. I also teach a few other courses. Pretty much kind of pulled back a little bit so I could focus on the ones that I uh, more commonly teach. So, of course, 560, and then the advanced pen testing course 660. Uh, I'm IONS faculty, the master's program, master's program, program director. Do I, how many programs do I need there? I don't know, whatever. Uh, principal consultant at Red Siege. I've been doing pen testing for, uh, for a long time. Uh, I've done blue team administration uh, as well. And what I kind of want to do here is, is talk you through some of the scenarios that I've seen both as the offensive person and the defensive person uh, because we're literally seeing a lot of the same things we've seen 10 years ago and we're hoping to eventually move that bar. I, I'd say eventually because sometimes it feels like that bar is going backwards or, or no, I don't know which, which direction bars are supposed to go, uh, but feels like the, whatever it is, it's the, it's the wrong way sometimes, right? So we need to let's 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 talk through some of that briefly. And by the way, if you have questions at any time, send those over. It might lag a little bit because I'm talking. I'll click. You'll get the uh, maybe the video and audio a few seconds later. Then you have to type. So I might address your question at the end or uh, at another time. So just be patient. We'll try to get to your questions. Uh, feel free to email or or Twitter or whatever afterwards as well. So let's jump through uh, some of the the basics here. Of course, the, the kind of simple, dumb answer here is, well, fix the simple stuff first, right? And this sounds so incredibly obvious, but time and time again, we go into organizations and they've got these gaping holes and they're like, hey, uh, we got this great idea. If we uh, put NAC inside the the, uh, the the server room, that's really going to help us with security. I'm like, well, I mean, you already have access controls uh, there. I mean, it already requires that the attacker physically be on premises. Uh, meanwhile, you have all these other things that every bad guy in the face of the planet who is 10 milliseconds from you, by the way, can attack. You seem to be focusing on the wrong thing. The deck chairs on the Titanic do not need to be arranged. We need to stop some of the, the flooding, right? And people are saying, well, whoa, we, wait, Tim, well, we can work on multiple problems at the same time. I mean, you, yes, but to some extent, no, right? You've got a finite team. You've got a finite budget. Pick the things with the, the biggest impact uh, first, right? If an attacker lands on your network and everything is wide open, they don't have to use any sort of exploits. So your entire patching process, they don't even, who cares, right? And you're spending a lot of time, money, and energy on that process. and frankly doesn't matter because you're missing something else, right? These Active Directory's mistakes mean that your network is literally designed to be insecure. It, it sounds sort of simple and, and obvious, but these mistakes mean the attacker doesn't have to abuse necessarily anything, doesn't have to use any fancy sort of tools. They just use what's, what's already there. Uh, one of my guys I was talking to, it's a Mike beforehand, he said, uh, it's not a bug. It, it's a feature, 
right? It, it's a hidden feature. And frankly, it's a feature you don't know that it's there, but every bad guy and every attacker is looking for these things. And it's frankly a little bit less hidden for them. So speaking of the bad guys, as a defender, it's always important to keep in mind, what's the bad guy looking for here, right? Now, many times we, we, we sort of focus on that incorrectly. And I don't want to spend too much time on that, but we as a offensive, as pen testers, as red teamers focus on domain admin, but that domain admin is just a tool. It is not the destination. Put, your, put yourself in the shoes of the bad guy, right? The bad guy, I hate to say it, but he probably has kids to feed too, right? They needs gas for his car. And, you know, if he's doing really well, like fancy cars, who knows? So they don't need all of your information. They just need some of it, right? Enough to make them money. So think about the, the bank, for example, right? They don't need all the, the, the account information of every single user. A few users with large bank accounts is going to do them just fine. Frankly, some of the accounts that I've seen would do me just fine, uh, you know, in a Western country. But if you live in some of these some of these other countries where the cost of lives, living is drastically lower, they could live very, very well on, you know, significantly less than we could in one of the Western countries. So one of the first things that we see too often is excessive sharing. So what we've got is we'll see, and this happens way too often, where we have file shares uh, and things like SharePoint that have sensitive data and it's accessible to everybody. And this isn't the cool, isn't it the, the, the neat, the sexy hack, right? This is, oh, you found it on the file share. And I've talked to, to, to targets time and time again, they're like, yeah, you know, we, we know it's there. Well, what? What? Okay, then why not address that, right? It goes back to our, well, we're set, we're setting up NAC in the server room to protect us. Yeah, but you've got this gaping hole over here that's welcomed everybody. Uh, this broad sharing, and the way I try to spin this is, this increases the impact of a breach. Now think about any user in your organization. A single user in your organization now gets gets popped, right? It could be, you know. I'm going to pick on Jason, Jason in marketing, right? Uh, Steve in accounting, wherever. And all of a sudden on this file share is the keys to the kingdom, right? And neither one of those people should probably have access to maybe that client banking information or the secret formula for Coke, but it's already out there. There's no reason that the attacker needs to pivot. The attacker doesn't need to move. It's just, it's just there. So any user now becomes a significant level of a breach. They don't need to move. They don't need to pivot, which means their dwell time, they don't, they don't need to be in your network as long to find this information. Uh, your ability to catch them at pinch points, I mean, it's already there. There is no sort of a pinch point. The, the key here is to remember that the attacker doesn't need everything. They just need some of it, right? Think about like GDPR. How many records do you have to have lost before you call it a breach, before you have to report? It doesn't take very much. And that news story is going to cost you a, a good chunk of change. I sort of related to that, goes back to roles base, and, and I see a question here from Aaron Cornell. I think he brings up his, uh, his point. It's always important to keep our focus, if we're on the offense here, is what is the data if lost, stolen, compromised, whatever, that would cause the greatest damage to your organization, right? What are the quote, as Aaron put it, the family jewels? Uh, and focus on that, not on these other methods like trying to get access, focus on the data. So that means if we find it in one of these places, well, we've achieved one of those goals, right? We found this. Now on the defensive side, we are trying to defend you know, they, the end zone, right? We're trying to defend this data, wherever this data may be. Instead of trying to protect, oh, we can't, we're gonna try to prevent them to, from getting a domain admin. No, 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 no. We're trying to prevent them from getting to our sensitive data, right? And it sort of changes the, uh, the picture a little bit. So how can we find some of this? Well, we've got like things like PowerView. PowerView is tremendously useful here. Um, and this is a tool, frankly, we can use as the offensive people, but as a defender, you should be using this as well. And in, in fact, some of these searches can take a long time, so it's even easier and better if you as a defender run through this yourself. All right, there's probably a good number of you who are uh, not offensive 
I guess depends on how you look at that, right? Uh, not an offensive role, right? There's many more blue team and defensive people than and, and administrative people than there are offensive. So run this, look for this. Now that the specific function here is find interesting, interesting domain share files. What this does is it's going to look across your domain for all your systems and then analyze, find all the shares and then start looking through those shares for files with specific names in them. We ran this at one organization. Uh, we had a horrible time. Now this is a, very, uh, a financial organization where you have to have a large sum of money before you can even knock on the door. And uh, we had a horrible time pivoting, horrible time trying to move. But users all over the place just created their own shares and they put files on. And we found you know, bank accounts and routing numbers all over the place with more than enough to retire, frankly, in the US, but especially anywhere else in the, in the world. So look for some of these type things. And of course, you can tune this. We're not, this isn't a, a full in-depth discussion of this specific uh, PowerView module, but it is tremendously, tremendously uh, user, uh, useful. The beautiful thing, too, is we can just use it as a regular user to see what that, you know, Jason in marketing or whoever the heck it might be, uh, what they have access to. Another thing that we see uh, way too often, frankly, and I hate to admit this, but I would rather tell you my mistakes so that you don't do them. Uh, but don't put passwords in the Active Directory description fields. Uh, we see this often, oh, way too often. There's sort of an assumption here that only the admins have either the capability or the ability to, to do this. That, hey, sorry, average users don't have the tools to view this. Well, right, you're not going up against your users. We're looking at an attacker who's now on your network. Um, here's an example here, right? So we'll see here a, a description. This one says, uh, Chicago Bears won. This is not a strong password. Uh, get it, Bears? I got Packers stuff here. Great joke, I'm sure at least one of you, I hope at least one of you <laughs> finds that joke a little bit funny. But realistically, I've seen this time and time again, where someone puts the password or some sort of derivative of the password in some of these fields where the assumption is, hey, only admins have the capability to do this. And we can find this both from a defensive and offensive uh, perspective in a number of different ways. We've got um, you know, PowerShell and a couple other tools. In fact, let's walk through uh, a number of these tools that we can use to find some of these pieces in your network. And again, if you're on the defensive side, quick search, look at these, clean them up, uh, use some sort of vaulting or packet, uh, password manager. So to look for this in uh, PowerShell, we can use built-in commandlets like get ad user. Uh, so get ad user, I'm gonna do a filter. I'm gonna say, you know what? I want all of the users. So ad filter star. I'm specifically gonna look for the description property. That's all I really care about. And I'm going to filter for a description greater than eight. Right, we're assuming here the password is at least eight characters. Um, look for some sort of information in there. Now, you're, you might be looking at this and it says properties description. It actually gets some of the basic information about the user as well as the description property. So you'll see like the SAM account name, the display name, and a few other field uh, pieces of information there as well. Now, we most commonly see this in the description field, but sometimes it's in some of the other fields as, as well. So take a peek around. Uh, and check that out. I don't want to see that again. I, I feel sort of bad pointing it out because it's a, you know, kind of a kind of a big mistake there. Another big thing that we see is um, sort of over permission. And a lot of this, we, I was talking to, frankly, for all of these, um, I hit up a number of the uh, smart pen testers I know. I talked to some of my guys. I talked to fellow SANS instructors uh, to sort of come up with this list for what are these common mistakes that we see related to Active Directory. Uh, one of them we kind of, we were talking about, it, it, it related to too many permissions, um, but we we're trying to figure that out and narrow it down to like, what is the exact issue here, right? Over being over, over permissioned. And we sort of came to the conclusion that some of the issues were related to significant use of nested groups where I put in a user in a group and then into another group and then another group and another group. And frankly, I just don't know how far down that rabbit holes uh, go, right? So I, I have to sort of dig through that a little bit. Now, 
you might try to use some of the uh, the, the built-in features here um, to look, and there's there's potential problems. We'll take a look here. So, well, first off, one of the ways that this can happen is you know it's you start adding groups and you start adding groups and you start adding groups and you add people and you start doing that. Another common uh, scenario is you have a merger, right? I mean, sure, there's a ton of you people that that have shown up to this that have to deal with buying another organization or acquiring or being acquired or whatever that means now. And now we've got their active directory and we have to shovel their IT into our IT and we're just, you know, moving that crap from one organization to another, right? And it's not necessarily getting picked up. We just sort of integrate and integrate. And again, if we have this level of access, it means that the attacker doesn't have to pivot as much, right? takes fewer hops to get to where they ultimately uh, need to go. Here's an example of, of some of the sort of difficulties with a lot of those nested groups. Uh, here I am looking at the, uh, the net command, so net group domain admins. Uh, and it shows me that I, I can see here, I have three users in that group, right? I've got administrator, my SQL agent, and my SQL engine. I mean, there's lots of problems here with, with the SQL engine being part of the administrators group. We'll talk more about that later. But now if we look at Active Directory users and computers, we can see here, ha ha, you can't see this group noob. And you'll notice that you don't see the group when we look at the group membership. All it does is show the users, right? So the, like the command line, which is nice for automation and scripting, is gonna lie just a little bit for us. And in fact, we've got a big long blog post on that. Feel free to check that out. I've got blog posts and references all over the, the presentation. So feel free to check some of those out. And by the way, none of these have anything to do with Holiday Hack. Sorry, probably lose half of you at this point. Okay, so we saw in the previous, uh, the previous slide, some of them issues, right? We missed that nested group with that user. How can we, how can we do that differently? Well, the DS commands, this is part of the uh, Active Directory um, Administration Pack, the RSAT tools, I forget what that stands for, but RSAT tools um, that come with, I think it was 2008, it's a little bit older tool set, but tremendously useful. Um, here I've got DS query. So I'm using DS query, looking for domain admins, piping that into DS get, so the DS query is gonna find me the group, DS get is going to expand and show me all of the members. Now what we can see here is, you know, in that group before the uh, haha, you can't see this group noob, there was actually another group inside that. And then inside that last group was a user. With this expansion here, I can now see the groups and the users. So this is a very useful way to see how deep does that rabbit hole uh, go. And again, another blog post if you're interested. With PowerShell, PowerShell uh, we can do the same sort of thing. So I can say get uh, AD group membership, specify the group name and say recursive. So for example, here is my domain. Now my, my lab domain here. So we can see here all those users, administrators, SQL engine, SQL agent. We can see that, you know, that RS, the Red Siege account that's uh, further down. We do miss the groups though. So we can see the ultimate users, which is useful, uh, but I am missing some of the groups because I might want to check permissions on the groups. Another common misconfiguration we see with Active Directory is users have permissions on the group itself when that group has permissions itself, right? Does that make sort of sense? I have got permissions to add and modify a group and then that group has permissions to do serious uh, and important things inside of our organization. So be very careful with that. That's why I like this DS a little bit better is it gives me sort of a, a bigger picture than what I get here with uh, with PowerShell, right? Also with those those shares, um, things we could do it and sort of related to this, this is kind of an in-between with those shares, right? Overly permissioned or excessive permissions or just wide open shares. Um, we had a, a question here, will disallowing employees to share folders with everyone group mitigate the problem? It will definitely lessen it, absolutely. That is, that we suggest the everyone is not great. Or if it is, you know, if you if you have those shares out there where everyone needs to get to, monitor that carefully because I can guarantee you sensitive information will show up there. And we tell users don't email sensitive information. So they're like, cool, let's just throw this on a share and guess when it gets cleaned up, right? Never. Um, 
what we can do here is we can use a weaponized link file. This is one of my, uh, a friend of mine, Derek Banks at uh, Black Hills, one of his uh, favorite sort of go-to tools. What we can do, if we've got a share that everyone is regularly accessing and browsing, I can create a malicious link. And we can use this uh, with, create this with uh, Metasploit. I just realized I forgot the module name there. Uh, but we can create the link with, uh, with Metasploit. And then we can capture the uh, the hashes with impact. And let me pull up my phone here and see what the module name was. Derek, uh, my buddy Derek texted me and I forgot to put it in here. And I can't remember because my my brain is not that great. It is, drum roll, auxiliary file format multi-drop. That's the one, good deal. And there's another link here uh, if you want to check out some of that. Now it uses a slightly different tool set. To, uh, to capture the hashes and to generate the link, but the process is the same. If you want to read how this works, uh, what the attacker, is, as I mentioned, does, puts this malicious link out on this file share. All you have to do is browse the web file share. You don't have to have the, the user even click on it uh, because what happens is that link attempts to load an image with the link uh, at a location of the attacker's choosing, and you, then you, request, you uh, say, hey, look, buddy, you should authenticate. And then our window systems will, of course, send over credentials, and we could potentially uh, crack those, or we might be able to relay those. Oh, my clicker didn't work here. There we go. So the obvious sort of one here is uh, passwords suck. Yep. Okay. I didn't want to put this in here. I get tired of harping on it, but I mean, to be honest, it, it, it's so true. Um, we had a scenario literally this week. It was. Um, uh, heck, Monday, now that I think about it, I think it was Monday. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we were doing a pen test for an organization, and uh, you know we, we, we got access to a system. And one of the things you can do once you first get access to a system is we can request tickets. Uh, we can request these tickets. It's, it's called a technique called curb roasting. And like I, again, there's plenty of other presentations. In fact, I have an entire presentation just on Kerberos. Uh, but the short version is, we can now get password material for uh, the service accounts inside the organization. There is a service account that we saw that is old enough to uh, drive and next year would be old enough to smoke. Uh, or I guess in Europe, you could probably do both of those already. Um, but it was from like 2003. Then the password was a monstrous six characters long, six. Right, so even if you add the password complexity requirements, if that password hasn't been updated since then, you're not going to have it. And in fact, the password complexity requirements we found have worked. Stop. They work against us because everybody knows to put an A instead of an at, or sorry, put an at instead of an A, or instead of an L to put a one. Right. These are the things everybody knows, including the attackers. But the Users think, oh, now this is a super secure password, right? And we add these passwords, they, they're very uh, difficult to remember, uh, not that much more difficult to crack. And then they're, they're, since they're so much more difficult to remember, people reuse, uh, they, they share passwords. Don't, right? St get rid of that crap. Just require longer ones. Um, we'll see these service accounts related to that is they're going to be overprivileged. Uh, especially if they're, it's more common to see this if they're an older service account. So before we had some of the more modern attacks, we would just give these service accounts all kinds of permissions because we didn't know it was necessarily a, a bad idea, right? Like before the curb roasting came out, you're like, you know what, the SQL server is so deep inside my organization, it doesn't matter. Uh, but now the things have have sort of changed. Now we do have just the one slide on passwords that suck because I am so tired of talking about passwords sucking to, uh, to, to us, right? I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, as we say. So the other one, and this one is this one is hard, right? The others we've sort of talked about with, with the passwords, right? I can Kerberos those, crack. I can do password guessing. I can, you know, get the dump passwords. The bad architecture. Uh, we see this these sort of things time and time. I kind of lump these together because these are not, frankly, as easy to, to fix. Um, because, well, frankly, it's architecture, right? And um, these were sort of, as we I, I talked to other pen testers, the other the other things that we talked about, those were the ones that kept coming up and kept coming up and kept coming up. Everyone kept mentioning those other issues. So and then we also have sort of these honorable mentions. Um, 
we see this way too often it's still, right? We need the separate accounts between the DA and the non-DA. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that. You all probably know that. Um, those sensitive accounts, we've got to be very careful with those, right? Uh, ideally, set logon hours for them and then follow up if they're used outside of that. Um, additionally, if, uh, you know, one of your admins logs in from the home office in Omaha, and then an hour later logs in from Moscow, you can't get there that fast, right? Our planes are pretty fast, but you are not getting there. That is going to be a, a problem, right? Enable things like credential guard to help protect the, protect the credentials on the, your, your modern Windows systems. Uh, things like Kerberos. We talked about Kerberos, Dean, right? Um, use AES for those tickets. And if there are any requests for um, RC4, alert and follow up, right? The key here for all of this isn't necessarily to stop everything. We need to sometimes detect and use that and say, you know what? We, we don't have a way to prevent this, but we can follow up afterwards and say, hey, look, let's, let's see, are we compromised? And reduce that dwell time inside of our organization, right? So that is gonna sort of wrap things up. Wow, that was a lot shorter. It's funny, when you, when you write these presentations, I always feel like, what? You know, you don't know how long it's going to last. I thought this was going to take about 45 minutes, and it is a little bit short. I don't think anybody's offended, are you guys? But uh, so anyways, sh any questions that I can uh, uh, answer here? I see a question here. What was that Metasploit module? Again, that Metasploit module, let me type it into the, uh, the answer box here once I get my mouse up to the right spot. It is auxil I can't spell this, auxiliary file format multi-drop and I will send that to all. Uh, I think Jim Lawton is telling me I spelled architecture incorrectly. He is probably right. Um, cool. So another question here. So it's sort of a defensive question. Um, what my thoughts are on creating a honey domain admin account. And frankly, this applies to sort of a, a lot of these things. One a great way to uh, prevent an attacker from, uh, you know, doing something nasty inside your network is to make them second guess everything. Oops, why is this not working? There we go. I uh, make them second guess everything. So have a domain admin account and have nobody log in with it. And if somebody ever touches that account, that's definitely a bad guy, right? Similarly with the um, the Kerberos tickets set up an SPN that no one uses. And if anyone requests a ticket, boom, now you've got a detection mechanism. You're, it's not a prevention. You can't prevent people from asking for those tickets, but you can detect afterwards. So if we can leave some of these traps behind for the bad guys, it makes our life a little bit easier. Again, not a protection, but a detection to decrease that dwell time of the bad guy in our network also makes the bad guy spend more time thinking and second guessing like, hey, is this good, is this bad? Which again, increases that dwell time and the likelihood you're gonna catch the uh, the bad guy. Um, when will Microsoft have a solution to uh, mitigate Kerber roasting? Well, the short answer is just use a good password. The longer answer is uh, they are rolling that out. So we're gonna start using, um, uh, it's a randomly generated value, I forget what it's called. Um, for that, but of course it requires all of your systems be on the latest and greatest and takes a little bit of extra effort to, to roll out. Uh, any resources for creating a Honey SPN? All you need to do for a Honey SPN is create an account, use the Microsoft Set SPN tool just like you would for any other account. Uh, do I have recommendations for, uh, for a red teamer with no admin experience to get hands-on experience with Active Directory? Um, no, other than maybe sit with the um, admin team if you've got some of that. I don't. I, I have a lab, although my background was Active Directory. I was an Active Directory administrator, so I've spent a lot of time with this. I'm sorry, Clinton. I don't have a great answer for that. Is there a way to audit enumeration of privileged groups? Yes. Use Go back to what we showed before with the, uh, the DS commands. Uh, dump that list of those privileged groups and start looking through and say, hey, who is supposed to have access here and start pulling that back? Is there an automated way to do that? No, that's why we call it an audit, right? So you're gonna look through that, you're gonna dump the information and go back. Now pick one at a time. It's gonna be, be seem very daunting at first. There's no question. 
Uh, but you know, the bad guys are going to do this for you if you don't. Is it the, does PowerView give you the ability to search for specific keywords and extensions? Absolutely, it does. You can change that. It comes with a default list, but you can override that. So if you have, you know, if you're the, uh, you know, I always use the secret formula for Coca Cola. If you have the secret formula for Coca Cola, you could search for secret formula for Coca Cola, right? Uh, what is the best source to understand domain uh, attacks? Um, the best is Sean Metcalf's blog, adsecurity.org. He has some fantastic resources. Um, it's funny, I came up with a technique, Kerber Roasting, but and I told Sean, I'm like, look, Sean, whenever anybody asks what it is, I just send them to your blog because they are so detailed. Um, they're absolutely fantastic resources. They are not short. Um, they are fantastic, detailed, they'll give you a lot of background. Um, best way to enumerate users that are local admin on systems? I'd have to think about that one, Stuart. Um, that's usually just involves just poking around and trying to log into those systems as a various user. Um, there is a uh, AD lab, someone link someone posted. So I'm going to share that with all of you in the, uh, the chat here. His question is, is there an efficient way of enumerating file shares we have right access to? Yes, the uh, PowerView or PowerShell, well, PowerView um, script can check for right access as well. And then you can write yourself. Cool, I think that is, uh, does AD uh, integration help or expose you, you know, to more security exploits? There's sort of pluses and minuses with each. The nice thing with the Azure AD is you oftentimes get some of the newest capabilities and features before everybody else. Um, like for example, the Azure AD had a password spray detections and mitigations before you got it on-prem. Cool, Andrew Hale, thank you for the presentation. Go Pack, yes, go Pack. <laughs> uh, GPOs can limit local admins and LAPS can randomize local admins. Absolutely, definitely the right way to, to, to go there. All right, by the way, the answer is, is this recorded? It is, the link will be up. I'm sure you'll get an email from, from Carol uh, very shortly here. Again, the slides are available. Uh, with that, I am gonna turn it back over to Carol. All right, thanks, Tim, for that great presentation. Um, so the slides are available on the website. I don't uh, send an email out just to clarify that. But, uh, but Tim also gave a link as to where you can find them. All right, so thanks so much for that great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.